Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Current Yield, Grant's Interest Rate Observer of the Air. I am Jim Grant, as usual, as, as Eric Whitehead, who is uh, at the control panel. He is re- working remotely, as has become his want, and indeed, the want of the world. Eric is in uh, Smithtown, Long Island. I myself am in Schoharie, New York, Cal Country. And uh, with us as well is the great deputy editor of Grant's, Evan Lorenz, who is, I think, from uh, the borough of Brooklyn. But because this is global, I think is the word of the day, global podcast. Uh, our guest today is uh, is Peter Warburton, about whom you'll be hearing a lot presently, and he is calling from, I think, London, comma, UK. But uh, before we get into the topic at hand, which is inflation, or its uh, opposite, or its middle shadow ground, um, it has been my custom in these podcasts during this period of uh, annoying lockdown and uh, quasi-lockdown and COVID-19-ism to bring up something utterly extraneous in the world of finance, uh, something I've come across during my time and postponing work is what we're talking about here. But I came across something that just astounded me, which is this fact. I got it from a Charles Moore column in The Spectator. And that is that William Wordsworth, the great Lake Country poet, William Wordsworth wrote 14 sonnets in favor of the death penalty. These are called Sonnets Upon the Punishment of Death. He was 71 years old, and he wrote at a time when there were 200 offenses in the British statute books uh, uh, stipulating the death penalty. I guess when you look crossways at uh, the central banker, that might have been a capital offense. I don't know. Can you imagine a sonnet upon the death penalty, the pro or con? You know, there are plenty of writers who are writing against the death penalty, Dickens and Thackeray and Tolstoy, but Wordsworth opposed total abolition of the death penalty, and he wrote sonnets. Okay, I'm going to stop because I am still, I've been reading some of these things. I'm just, I'm not going to read them. But, well, Jim, did you know that some of these permissions were um, still remain on the statute book? So uh, apparently that if you belong to the city of Chester, then you can still use lethal force against a Welsh person. So you know, uh, it hasn't oh, quite, been exercised right. lately, but sense, so it, you have to be careful when you make laws that yeah. they may just hang around longer than you thought. Right. And so with, so with economic policies, I suppose, Peter, whom you just heard, Peter is the uh, founder and the... Uh, a leading voice of Economic Perspectives, which is a uh, consultancy in England. He's an alumnus of Warwick University and uh, got his PhD from the City University of London, the author of Debt and Delusion, with the very fitting subtitle, Central Bank Policies That Threaten Disaster. He wrote that um, 1999, which I say is prescient. Some might call that early. Um, but around here, Grant Interest Ray Observer, the word is prescient. All right. Uh, Peter uh, consults with the uh, famed value shop Ruffer & Co. and is as an alumnus of, among other institutions, Robert Fleming. I see a Lehman Brothers reference here, too, but that's fine, Peter. Uh, Patricia Cavanaugh, uh, otherwise known as Mrs. James Grant, worked at Lehman Brothers when it was, uh, I suppose, as you did when it was actually solvent. Mm-hmm. Peter, welcome to this program. Uh, you are, to my mind, one of the foremost thinkers about inflation in all its nuance. So let's simplify this, if we may. I mean, uh, all of us have heard this Milton Friedman line, because Milton Friedman said it, how could be true? So here it is. Ready? Inflation is always and everywhere a monetary phenomenon. True? Partially true. I think the, the institutional um, framework has moved on quite a lot from Milton Freeman's day. And I, and I think obviously there was a time when essentially the two sides of bank balance sheets were pretty much the whole story for credit creation. But clearly we, we've moved on a, a great way from that. Well, Peter, and, let, me, let, me, let me ask you this, if I may. Given, you know, giving all due notice and respect to the institutional nuances and then the transformations in the past uh, couple of generations. M3, the most broadest measure of America's money supply, it's not officially calculated, but can be pieced together, which uh, Shadow Stats does. Uh, M3 is growing or was growing year over year in May at uh, in excess of 25%, which is the fastest uh, peacetime rate in modern times. And on its face, this would seem to be an almost certain indicator of a coming inflation. But I've just finished reading your global inflation report from from June, just just out. And I am reminded reading this that there's a lot more to it even than the seemingly dispositive figure of 25% in broad money. So what else figures into the uh, inflation stew? And do we have the materials or ingredients to deliver us an inflation rate that will scare the pants off the bond market? Yes. To the last question, absolutely. I mean, I, the way I like to think about it is, and, and these are clearly not mutually exclusive, but they're, they're kind of like distinctive ways of thinking about the inflationary mechanism. 
Okay, so dominant transmission and, and the one which is embedded in, in these horrible models, which I'm sure you don't approve of, that central banks have and uh, universities have and uh, lots of macro um, institutions have, is obviously the you know some kind of overheating, Keynesian overheating model, kind of output gap or uh, capacity utilization type model. So, I mean, that clearly is the, that's the dominant way that people think about inflation in economics. The one that you began with, the, uh, the excess money supply growth and thinking of that really as being a hand in hand with, if you like, over borrowing by the private sector. I mean, so I think that that obviously is a very significant complementary mechanism. I want to talk about two others. The one which I think has become more and more important over the last 30 years, which is supply chain inflation. And I think probably the most recent example of that really was 2010, 2011, when we, we had a spike in the oil price. It was accommodated in uh, lots of emerging market countries, and they basically inflated their cost bases, and, and those costs then just ran through to developed market economies. Our central banks decided just to look through it and not to regard it as being something that they should take notice of for policy purposes. So but what we did have, we had supply chain inflation around 10 years ago, and, and potentially um, we, we could see it again at any, at any point. But the fourth one is the neglected and the most controversial one, which is whether governments create inflation by their fiscal indiscipline. And um, I would like to suggest that they do. It's not a popular notion, but I think when people think only about inflation as occurring as a private sector phenomenon, I think they are missing a trick. And indeed, I think we're in a circumstance now where, where the government is doing its very best to um, prove that it can create inflation. By you know, Peter, the, um, we who uh, anticipate inflation have been anticipating a while and have talked ourselves a little bit into the predicament of the boy who cried wolf. I don't include you mm. Ignoble camp, but I myself am a little chagrined at uh, looking back. I, you know, I, I, I was one of the signatories to uh, a petition that we should never be a signatory to an open public document like that. It's crazy. But I was younger then and didn't have a judgment. I now command. This was about you know, six months ago. No, it was about uh, eight years ago or nine years ago. But one of the uh, uh, the great uh, uh, hedge fund titans of Wall Street got together some people to sign a petition warning the Fed against uh, QE because it was on its face inflationary. And of course, it, it uh, uh, one could, and I don't think it's a somatic trick, one could observe that there are many types of inflation. You yourself talk about the, uh, the nuances of inflation. Certainly, asset prices have not been going down. Uh, but CPI inflation, inflation in the checkout counter has not materialized. That is the question I get most frequently. Given what the central banks have done, you would expect, you had expected, that the CPI would not be running at one point, whatever it's running but rather at three or four or five or six, not hyper, mind you, which is something not less than two. Yeah. I mean, I, I clearly have these conversations very, very frequently when, when I, you know, lay out my stall on inflation as well. Um, I think there are, there are, there are a lot of mitigating factors and obviously some around measurement as well. But and it's not to dismiss the fact that we've had a lot of, of positive supply shock. So positive supply shocks are the very best because uh, potentially they give you more output and less inflation at the same time. Give us an example um, of one or two of those. Well, I mean, a, a bumper grain harvest, for example, or a drop in the oil price or a new technology that, that genuinely um, releases resources to, um, you know, to another productive use. Or Jeff um, Bezos personally. Yeah. So, so I, I'm, you know, I'm all in favor of, of, of positive uh, supply shocks. But the thing is that they, we can't count on them continuing. And certainly, um, I think, obviously, uh, deglobalization, to use an ugly word, is carrying us in the, in the opposite direction and you know certainly if we go deeper into the realms of protection and also you know localized supply chains and so on and then it's easy to see how some of those positive uh, supply shocks might unwind um, in the in the rather near future but but I, I think the emphasis that I would have now really is that government in its you know sort of panic reactions to covid 19 um, has over egged the pudding and um, you know it is to report at a time uh, when the labor market has, has, is undergoing such huge upheaval that, unless I have it incorrectly, um, the disposable income is actually rising, uh, it, rising faster than before in the U.S. And that, that's a sign to me that... Yeah, Evan, Evan, you pointed this out, that with the uh, supplemental unemployment benefits, that uh, it's been rather, for people who are situated in the right spots, it's been 
rather a boon. Yeah, I believe that in April, government transfers were up like 100% year over year. And I believe in May, they were up something like 60% year over year, which led to total personal income actually rising despite the fact that there were fewer jobs. It's been one of the yeah. perverse things about this uh, downturn. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I think the the notion that somehow that the saving rate is going to stay up at 20% or 15%, uh, and I think is somewhat fanciful. I mean, I, I would have thought that as the support programs roll off, uh, not just in the US, but around the world, that those saving rates will, will come crashing down to earth pretty quickly. And a lot of spending power will be you know, presented to the market at a time when a lot of producers certainly haven't got their act together. Uh, and obviously, where you get phase, you know, ending of lockdown and so on, then you're going to have all kinds of dislocations in the production process where from being, you know, sort of ha- having oversupplied with, with inventory, there'll be, you know, shortages of inventory and, and difficulties of, of actually resuming production. So it seems to me that just thinking about this, this next six months, I, I see a, a lot of potential for, as it were, you know, government augmented demand to outstrip available supply. And finance with a a huge redundancy, perhaps, of purchasing power. Peter, one one of the things we always see in commodity cycles is when a commodity begins to get scarce, um, buyers of the commodity will put in multiple orders just to get the fill that they want to to get in. Taking deglobalization aside, I think one of the lessons that a lot of companies are taking from the disruptions in the last six months or so is that just-in-time manufacturing and lean operations leave you very unprepared for any kind of shock. And if we do begin to reverse that, that would be a productivity hit, but also a giant working capital build which could lead to kind of some of the things we might have seen in, you know, small uh, commodity cycles. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, there's, I think there's all kinds of precautionary stroke perverse behaviors that uh, we, we're, we're likely to see. I mean, obviously, there's a lot of discussion about the, you know, the crude oil market in particular, but also I've, I've heard discussions about natural gas prices possibly rebounding. And I, there, are, there are many things to consider. And so back to your point, Jim, about, you know, bond investors have anything to fear. Um, I have, I think they have a great deal to fear. And, and what I would point to really is the extent to which people disagree about the inflation outlook. So regardless about whether, whether you, you know, you, you are confident uh, that inflation is going to suddenly be higher or not, but the, the, this uncertainty, this disagreement about, about what inflation will be, that's significant in itself. And in the past, it's been significant for increasing the term premium and with that increasing the, the slope of the bond yield curve as so well. As, so as we, as we speak, Peter, the, um, uh, the 10-year gilt, the 10-year government security in the UK is at 19 basis points yield of maturity. I've forgotten who was um, the name. I fear, you're, I fear that you're right, yes. Who was the name of the, what's the, name of the um, chancellor who in 1946 said, uh, never before has His Majesty's government borrowed at such a little cost and for so long. It's a famous laborite. Anyway, that was about a 2% yield, and that was the prelude to a, uh, the generation plus of inflation and, and the, uh, the absolute destruction of savings yeah. that were committed at those yields that were substantially higher than today's. We at Grants keep an informal running tally of the um, number of secure, dollar value of securities worldwide price to yield less than nothing in nominal terms. It's always like it's more than 10 trillion. It has been, right? I've been looking at it recently. But yeah, the last it, time I looked at it, it was, a, it was what? It was like 10 or 11 trillion, I think. Yeah. So yeah. let's call it $10 trillion worth of bonds, mostly short dated notes, price to yield less than nothing in currencies that central banks are telling you they intend to devalue. And isn't this the most extraordinary thing? And, and people kind of, you, know, you get used to it. Even as people in 1981 got used, yeah, the government security is yielding 15%. Yeah, mm-hmm. that's what they do. But to think that they, that they so um, Peter, um, Prime Minister Boris Johnson gave a talk, I think maybe two days ago now, and in which he appeared in um, an instruction worker garb and uh, including a hard hat, fit him very ill, like a beanie. But Boris Johnson said in his flamboyant way that he was going to, no cheese pairing about this stimulus, that he's going to get the, he's going to build Britain better. And then he had to, he felt uh, obliged to say, uh, quote, I am no communist, but this is a Tory laying out a program of most aggressive fiscal stimulus and the central bank that is openly talking about negative yields, this would seem to be, one doesn't say these things out loud, having been wrong about this, would seem to be an obvious setup for a really bad 10 or 20 years in bonds. Yes, obviously some of us have thought that 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 10 or 20 years might have started five years ago. Uh, and, and you know, there clearly has been, in my mind, a capitulation of central banks to a conventional wisdom that the economy um, couldn't tolerate a conventional interest rate cycle. Yeah. And so that what I, you know, 
have taken to describe as central bank socialism uh, is, is basically that out of compassion for, for the economy, interest rates have not been raised, or if they've been raised, they've been raised very, very tentatively and reversed somewhat more um, enthusiastically. So I think we, you know, the, the point at which we have arrived is one where we are ripe for a change in the monetary regime. Yeah. And, well, what kind, of, what kind of, what kind of, we, since we, we, we we're having it now, what, what kind of change is perspective in your mind? Well, I mean, the, the idea, and obviously this takes us into perhaps a, a different way of thinking about money, but basically money as a societal invention and you know, that basically money is what is widely accepted as holding some uh, function and value. So, so basically, if you take that line, then, then basically periodically society can redefine uh, what, what it regards as, as important. And basically, if we, if, if we decide that, you know, more transport and more buildings and more schools and infrastructure, that is our, our new standard, um, then we will create power um, for that to happen. But that will have a consequence for all the existing claims that exist. You know, well, Peter, one, one of the things that impressed me about this latest uh, piece of work you produced, the, uh, the Global Inflation Perspective, is that it is a probabilistic uh, investigation, nothing dogmatic about it. The outcome you think is is rather likely is stagflation, which is a state of affairs last really seen in the 1970s, in which there is very little growth, but a lot of inflation, a lot meaning high single digits, perhaps. I think in Britain is rather much higher than that, but still not hyperinflation. But to this, you only give a one in four chance. You're saying that it is one of the possible outcomes, but not by no means a certain one. How is it that economics of you know three hundred year old discipline and recognizable form? How is it that you can't even be sure of an outcome with seemingly such you know twenty five percent money growth and deficits unimagined uh, even six months ago are now coming out? Uh, why why can't one be more definite about these things? Yeah, I, I think um, the answer to that is that I mean I might refer here to David Rosenberg's views. So. David, I think, believes that, that we have depressive conditions, and he's very skeptical about the gale and extent of recovery. And I can share a lot of his, his concerns. So I come to a very different, different conclusion about inflation, but I, I do think that if the loans which are being made now, the tide is over, if those turn out basically to go bad because the, the recovery just doesn't give us enough momentum, it doesn't give us enough growth, it doesn't give us enough capacity to service these debts, then six months or 12 months down the road, then we could be back into, you know, depressive circumstance. So, so having basically survived the heart attack of, you know, of, of COVID-19, that we fall victim to the drugs, as it were, that, that we subsequently ingest. And, and so could we, a year from now, be looking at deflation? Yes, of course, it's entirely possible, it's still entirely possible, but it, it would represent a colossal failure policy. As I see it, the residual function now of the authorities is to have an inflationary sort of downturn rather than a deflationary one. And, and of course, ben, ben Bernanke has insisted that that was always um, within the remit of the Federal Reserve. If stagflation does happen and um, central banks uh, practice yield curve control, which they're talking about, what does that do to the financial markets? Yeah, I, I would begin by saying I don't think that yield curve control in a U.S. context would look anything like the, the sort of the absolute you know, nominal control that we see in Japan. I, I think that there would be a range in which yields could move. And I think a very good reason for maintaining a range, you know, is allowing the banks still to have some basis for making money. You know, so in a depressed economy, then they would not be making much money from loans. And so I think they'd need to make it off the curve. I don't envisage yield curve control in the U.S. ever being strictly applied uh, as, in, as in Japan. But I, I think the more general point really is if inflation expectations have been destabilized, which, which I think is what is happening at the moment, then, then a large element of coercion is going to be required in any case to yield curve control effective. Uh, now, we, we have that you know, degree of coercion in certain regulatory aspects, but it seems to me that there's still enough scope for discretionary investors, um, particularly foreign investors, to seek to, uh, to exit the market. And, you know, so, so again, I would have to question whether the commitment would be there to buy all the secondary market debt that will be required to make yield curve control effective. I don't, I don't know, Peter. I mean, the government says stay in your house and people did it. I mean, I, 
I'm uh, most impressed by the uh, uh, the willingness of people to uh, submit to commandments from on high. Wouldn't have thought it possible, but then along came March. Hey, um, uh, Peter, one final thing, if I may, and that is, uh, you know, that you talk about in the appendix to this fine piece of work, you talk about uh, the ethereal nature of inflation, find any number of ways. And there are, of course, measurement errors connected with almost each of those methods. And you also mentioned something that is very 21st century, the idea of a government price taker going to the supermarket and, and looking on the shelves for prices and then writing them down. All this seems so very 20th century. And here we have the Billion Prices Project, which I think came out of the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. And yeah. it's the real-time calculation of prices on the World Wide Web. And you have to know somebody to get it or price or, or pay a fancy price to subscribe to it. But there's something called price stat. That, so, you know, Peter, you, you talk about the many different kinds of inflation, many different ways of measuring it. And you mention in this list, there's a, a fine 21st century approach, which is to scrape the web. And MIT and others succeeding MIT have done this called the Billion Prices Project. What are these computer scraping results showing are prices rising, falling, or remaining the same? It's interesting that from around late April, early May, the price measure for the U.S. has ticked higher. And I'm not bang up to date, but it seems to me that um, even if you look at the latest sort of you know, CPI as defined, then it no longer has a, a negative bias. So I'd like to suggest, you know, very tentatively, that we might have a positive inflation surprise very soon in terms of even, oh. even of the, you know, in other words, I think, you know, that we, we're dealing with such powerful forces, you know, obviously pulling in different directions. But, I, you know, I, I, I think that we could see really quite a, a volatile profile, but within that, a, a much sooner experience of the price level rising again much sooner than expected, which, which, which again, I, I think that, w that would be a bit of a shock um, in some quarters. It would indeed. Peter Warburton, thank you for being with us. It's been uh, most informative. And even, Peter, I'm going to, yeah, yes, it's true. Even with an economist, it has been scintillating. Yeah, I'm going to go out on a limb and assert that. So uh, Evan Lorenz, thank you for, as always, for being in line. Eric, thanks for the uh, fine work at the controls. On behalf of Current Yield, Grant's Interest Rate Observer of the Year, I'm Jim Grant, and we will talk to you soon.